call the meeting of Tuesday, September 21st to, to order. And um, a motion on the minutes. So moved, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. Our next committee meeting will be October 13th. And um, we will have an in-camera um, at the end of this to discuss an e-com session. And Councillor Hobbs has an item on River Road for item number 14. Uh, as chair, I'd like to, um, as we have done, um, take the, uh, the privilege to um, uh, read a couple of statements uh, because of da certain dates that have passed us uh, with regard to our finest uh, in Richmond and um, our members who have fallen in the line of duty uh, with the, um, the RCMP. And um, September the 15th, 2021, marked the 19th anniversary of the on-duty death of Constable Jimmy Ng. On September 2015, 2002, Constable Ng was working a night shift in Richmond while responding to a routine call for service Constable Ng was broadsided by a vehicle div driven by uh, Mr. Chan. Chan, another male, had been street racing when Chan blew a red light and collided with Constable Ng's uh, police cruiser. The point of the impact being the driver's door, Constable Ng was transported to the hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Chan attempted to elude the capture by even the scene of the accident with the driver in the other car. He had received a two-year jail term, two years in probation, as well as three years of driving probation for this um, homicide. Council Blaine grew up in Richmond and learned to read and write Chinese and spoke Mandarin and Cantonese. He had loved the outdoors, enjoyed camping, fishing, scuba diving, and boating. He also played soccer and hockey. After taking a four-year course in food sciences at the University of British Columbia, he had worked for Bright's Winery. He also served as a firefighter with Okanagan Falls in the Volunteer Fire Department. Constable Ng was a dedicated police officer whose commitment to our community did not stop at being a police officer. He volunteered his time with the Canadian Coast Guard and became a member of Search and Rescue and our patrol. We will continue to remember him. Constable Jimmy Ng, rest in peace. One of our other fallen that need to be reminded of. And that was on September the 19th, 1980, Constable Tom Agar. It marks the 41st anniversary that this on-duty officer met his death. On September 19, 1980, Constable Agar was working the front counter duties of the Richmond Detachment on Mineral Boulevard at our old location and offered assistance to a male, later identified as Stephen LeClaire. Constable Agar did not know Leclerc, Leclerc had just shot five people at the Palace Hotel in Vancouver, killing three. After the shooting, Leclerc was determined to kill a police officer and hijacked a taxi at gunpoint, forcing the cab driver to take him to the Richmond detachment. When Constable Agar asked Leclerc if he needed assistance, Leclerc responded by fatally shooting Constable Agar at point blank range. Constable, uh, Leclerc then turned his gun on another officer Councilor Wayne Hanneman, striking him in the thigh before surrendering to officers just outside the detachment. Leclerc was convicted of first degree murder and received a life sentence. Constable Tom Agar's wife Joyce was pregnant at the time of his death. The couple had a young daughter named Samantha. At the depot, there is an Agar Lane in memory of Tom Agar. He's buried in Ocean View Cemetery in Burnaby. Rest in peace, Constable Tom Agar. And I think we as uh, community safety people need to remember our fallen and uh, pay tribute to them and not let their memory uh, fade, lest we forget. With that, I'll go into the, um, the agenda, and it's an open agenda. If anybody has anything, um, let me know. And we can add it at the end. Okay, uh, Mark, we're on the business quarterly reactivity report on page 11. Anything to add to the report? I just want to say it was great to see uh, a number of months back to back. You weren't reading the same thing. You were getting a, a double dose of things. So anything to add? Uh, to the chair, I have nothing to add, and I'm open to questions. Anything from the committee? Great reports. Thank you. Andy? 
Um, yeah, go ahead. Is Andy, can you unmute Andy there? Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, that was a, a good report, uh, lots of information. Just, um, I, I did note you noted uh, quarter two was very positive in terms of numbers, and I thought actually all the numbers in quarter two were positive, but just a quick question um, for revenue in 2019. Um, why is it that, uh, is there an explanation why 2016 seems to be uh, a little bit high and, uh, or why so low rather? Was there a policy change? Uh, and 2019 likewise for being high. Uh, was there something significant happening or is that just a random kind of occurrence? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, in, in 2019 there was significant activity around Airbnbs. Uh, so there was a technological shift when uh, illegal suites uh, became more of a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, you'll note in this report, the revenue is down, and you'll see it in the, in the following properties report, um, the numbers in illegal suites have gone down significantly. We attribute that to a lot of the disruption from the COVID pandemic and a disruption in international travel. Anything else? Motion to, uh, to approve for information, receive for information, move, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. Okay, on to our, for June uh, 2021. Anything there? Uh, to the chair, yes, I have a minor errata to note. Um, it is in regards to page three uh, under Greece. Uh, there was no violation notice issued in that month. Great. That's good. Carol? Move a higher volume, please. Thank you. Okay. Good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, on CS17, um, it states that there are 62 soil site inspections and 40 of those were non compliant. That seems an extremely high rate. Is there a reason for that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, I can uh, follow up on that uh, and get back to the committee. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Michael? Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair to staff, um, mine, I had a similar question. So if I could be copied on that memo, that was something I had a, a interest. And I won't ask it in the next item, but I did note that there were 40 properties in June and 36 properties in July that were non-compliant. So if we could just get like a, a little bit more information on what, what is the non-compliancy and or how are they being addressed and, and solved. Uh, my other question though, um, if I may, through the chair and staff, is um, the, the list of, of one property on page 17, CS17 under soil, it talks about $9,990 being collected from a property. Could, could you provide um, a, a little bit of overview of what constitutes a $10,000 fine. Um, okay. uh, through the charity counselor, through the charity counselor Wolf, I can follow up on that request as well. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Michael? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none, moved, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. And we have July's report on page 20. Anything there? Um, uh, to the chair, yes, again. Uh, to the chair, I just have one um, minor errata as well. There's similarly uh, the same error under Greece that there was one violation notice issued. In fact, there was not a violation notice issued. Okay, so we've got it corrected. Michael, again. Sorry, uh, thank you. If I may, real quickly, uh, through the chair to staff. Um, on page our, our page uh, CS23 under bylaw prosecutions, it, it, there's one sentence here. I just want to get it clarified if it's, if it's correct. Uh, it says that the property owner was found not guilty during the trial, but did not remove the overheight fence. So does that overheight fence still need to be removed, or because they were not guilty, it, it's fine? Uh, I'm just not sure the way it's worded in that sentence. Thank Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, yes, it was a, a less than um, you know we 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 had hoped for a better outcome. Uh, however, it was it was a technicality which occurred vis-a-vis -a, -vis a measuring of the fence. 
the property owner had indeed removed the fence during the trial. So that was a positive outcome. And it, it states in the report, the property owner was found not guilty during the trial, but did remove the overheight fence. Great, thank you. Just to clarify that, thanks. Okay. Anything else? Motion to approve. All those in favor, thank you. Moved and seconded there. Okay, page 25, our committee parking enforcement for June. Uh, who's Susan? Are you? Okay. Or Susan. Okay, anything to add to that report? A good report, thank you. Nothing to add, happy to answer any questions. Okay, Carol. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McNulty. Um, thank you for the report. On CS26, it states that there were 93 patrols on parks and dikes and that the, and that the top um, patrol area was Gary Point uh, because I guess there's a lot, I know from talking to people who work, who go out there that there is a lot of problems with dogs. What my question is, is how does this compare to the service we previously received from the other animal control provider? Because that seems like a lot of patrols, 93 through the chair to count for a day. Uh, yes, the SPCA officers have uh, stepped up significant uh, patrols uh, targeting Gary Point uh, specifically, which you will see in July's report, the reflection of the office patrol. All right, good to hear, thank you. Okay, any other questions on June? Motion to approve, receive for information, it's just, thank you, move seconded, all those in favor, contrary, carry. Um, on to July's report, uh, if um, anything uh, uh, to add or anything to discuss. Carol, back to you. Um, uh, so on page, I didn't write down the page, sorry. Uh, the SPCA officers uh, in uh, July and August were starting at 7 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. Uh, on their patrols. And I was just curious why only July and August, because with the better weather, you know, once summer hits in June or even late May, I would think that a lot of uh, people would be out dog walking. And the people I've talked to go out really early because they go out before work. So why would they uh, only start at 7 a.m. just for July and August? And is there plans to expand that next year? Through the Chair of Councillor Day, the contractual hours at that, uh, are 9 a.m. in the morning. So the officers, uh, the decision was made for the officers to start at 7 a.m. for the reasons that you stated, to catch the early morning um, individuals walking their dogs on the trails and dikes and in the parks. When the contract moves forward in January of 2022, the starting hours throughout the seven days a week will be 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Oh, okay, so starting next January. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Michael. Uh, th uh, thank you uh, very briefly um, to the chair to staff. Uh, I didn't ask it on the last item um, because last I the last item had 20 plus stray cat calls, but in July on this item you're discussing there were 35 stray cat or dog calls. Um, I'm not sure if you can clarify were most of them cats, or most of them dogs. It was the highest category in all of June for the callouts for bylaw, uh, community bylaw enforcement. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, curious about that aspect of it. And um, I know in, in, in northern uh, municipality to the north, there'd be a lot of calls about coyote issues. Could um, staff just comment on um, the behavior of our coyotes? I know there's uh, 20 plus wildlife calls, but we're not seeing the behavior that Vancouver Stanley Park is seeing with coyotes. Um, if you could clarify that, thanks. Sure. Through the chair to Councillor Wolf. Uh, stray cats, which we've addressed in August report, uh, speaks to uh, individuals leaving windows open, doors open, and cats um, getting free of the house and, and running off, and officers are then called for stray cats. In regards to coyote uh, calls, we have not, uh, the SPCA has not had any calls to attend for, for, for coyotes. Uh, and we have not received any calls for service through community bylaws uh, by request in regards to coyotes being in any of the parks 
that officers have been called to attend or to uh, address. Uh, thank you, then, if I may just follow up comment, then. I, I've, I saw many coyotes in, in July, but all of them were on the, the outer banks, or on sturgeon banks or on the outer side of the dike, uh, doing what coyotes do. So, um, yeah, it's positive to hear that we're not seeing the same issue that's been um, da well, very daunting for park use uh, to yeah. the north. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, anything else on the July report? Motion to approve. Second, thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, okay, thanks very much, Susan. Okay, uh, Fire Rescue Monthly Activity Report. I think we have an introduction, do we not? Okay. Uh, Jim? Jim Wishlove? Oh, Tom, Chief. Tom Wilkins. Jim Wilkins, I know you're here. Yes. Sorry, I've got two screens and not exactly everybody's up. There you are. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Or yours. Chief Wishlove will make those introductions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the newly hired uh, emergency programs manager now working at uh, Rich and Fire Rescue. Uh, Brendan McLaughlin uh, was chosen as the top uh, competing candidate from a field of over 45 qualified national and international applicants. And is Brennan, if you have his screen on here, uh, Brennan brings uh, significant experience and ability in planning and operations, including working as a Canadian military officer, uh, leading operations and planning not only in Canada, but also overseas during crises and UN missions. Uh, Brennan currently is also a reserve military officer serving locally with the Seaforth Highlanders and was recently assigned for the past three years as a brigade staff officer uh, working in human resources with a focus on planning and leading domestic and international military operations. Uh, his work included overseeing uh, the personnel administration and planning uh, for the military in mainland BC uh, for domestic responses, including wildfires and the military's COVID-19 actions and preparedness. Outside of his uniform and uh, regular work, Brendan and his partner keep busy with their four children and his Insatiable appetite for hobbies and for being outdoors. And uh, Brendan actually started yesterday here with the leadership team at uh, RFR Number One Fire Home. We're very pleased and honored that he's uh, joined us working uh, with community safety on behalf of the city. So, welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Jim. Welcome, uh, Brendan, to our team, and glad to have you aboard on behalf of the committee here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, back to you. Uh, Chief? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have nothing to add on our June report. Okay, we got June. Anything uh, from any, um, Alexa? Uh, thank you through the chair and thanks for your report and nice to meet uh, uh, Brennan McLaughlin. I am hope hopeful that uh, everything will be smooth for him and his family joining, joining the Richmond family. Um, just looking over on CS44, you talk about time on scene as being 33 minutes, which is up slightly, but then uh, moving into the following report for July, CS55, you talk about time on scene being 56 minutes. So I think, I feel like that was a huge jump from one month to the other. So I'm wondering if it's a typo or if it's something happened significantly to bring up that average, like if there's one or two big events that brought that average up. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Lou, uh, no, uh, there wasn't a major uh, event. Rather, we're having an ongoing um, wait time with BC Ambulance, um, and uh, that that wait time is increasing exponentially. And it's um, we are waiting for the provincial government to come out with their report sometime mid uh, September. Okay, because we had heard that the BC Ambulance Service was adding um, more more paramedics, more ambulances. We had heard that, and then we also had asked at a previous meeting to get an update from BC Ambulance. So I'm wondering, uh, obviously not from you, Mr. Wilkinson, but uh, from staff, if we got any anything further on the BC Ambulance information or being able to invite them here. 
through the chair and councillor Liu, uh, we are awaiting the pr province has put together a committee all around the uh, issues with BC Ambulance. And that report is meant to come in mid-month this month. Uh, and uh, once that report comes out, we were uh, going to provide you with all that information and, uh, and look to bring in uh, representatives of BC Ambulance at that time. They really don't have much to tell you right now. They're just not sure of what, what actions are going to be next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Carol? States that there were 390 medical incidents in June 2021 compared to 57 in June 2020. That was an increase of 584 percent. Is that primarily because of the heat dome, or was there something else going on? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dave, uh, that is actually the relaxing of the provincial health orders and us returning to our normal event uh, responses. Oh, good. I thought maybe there was something I missed. Excellent. Thank you for the report. Uh, Andy? Uh, thank you. And through the chair, um, thanks for the reports. and. Um, just a, a quick welcome also to Brennan. I think any time that um, organizations can latch on to Canadian military personnel, especially in terms of emergency operation planning and logistical uh, tasks, it's always a find because the Canadian military uh, does an exceptional job at that. So welcome, Brennan. Uh, just a quick question on page 54. You talked about the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre and the contribution that uh, Richmond firefighters made to that. And uh, we all heard about that. I just wondered if you could make a quick comment on how that went and how the members are that went there, because it would have been quite stressful and quite busy. And I just wondered uh, essentially how the members are doing. Uh, thank you for your question. Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, uh, the members were uh, felt quite proud and privileged to be able to offer their skills to the to these smaller uh, areas. Um, we had three main deployments, uh, one of uh, which was short in duration, but highly intense in Lytton. Uh, when they arrived, essentially the town was almost all on fire and a uh, very, very difficult time for the people who lived there, of course. Uh, the firefighters were able to do what they could, but there's very little to save at that point. Uh, our next two deployments were of 12 days in duration, each deployment. So our staff were away for, from home for quite some time. Uh, and they were moving up and down the, the valleys, making sure that the roads were staying open and making sure that people had evacuation routes. So as you said, really quite stressful. Uh, they had a couple of uh, uh, incidences where they had to evacuate on a moment's notice with the fire coming straight over the over the top of their vehicle uh, they're all fine they're um, uh, they found it to be an exciting and privileged opportunity to serve go ahead carry on well thank you and through the chair just on that uh, well thank you very much and uh, all of you should know I think all the citizens in Richmond certainly my family uh, appreciates the effort because that's always stressful and uh, being away from home makes it even worse. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael, you're next. Uh, th thank you very much uh, through the chair. Um, welcome, Brendan. And uh, two questions for uh, Fire Chief and, and perhaps more uh, also to staff at the end. Um, my question is about the events that happen on uh, June 8th, June 28th. That's on our page CS. 45 at the very bottom. It's one of the significant events. And that day alone was a very significant event. Many heat records across the region were broken. Uh, many people were staying home because work on that Monday morning was just going to be too hot, so people at home. So my question is about that, uh, a few questions about that event. Um, first, it was a, a tire fire in a hopper. So if you could just kind of clarify um, for us what that looks like, because I've been tracking the number of industrial fires recently. Um, so first off, the, the hopper is going to feed where there's a fire burning for some process. Um, so was that a, a problem, and, and is that being addressed, or was it for this 
site, was it okay to have the shards of tire to burn? Um, and it was just a spark that ignited it, so then it blew in the area where it wasn't ventilated and wasn't filtered, and that's why it was such harmful black smoke. That was my first question related. And the second one is um, responding to this. With already the heat and people have things that were melting that day, um, did, did any fire equipment, I know I, I appreciate you saying that the fire uh, fighter uh, health was, was, was ended up okay and they were being tested and they had some dizziness and, and, and effect and, and in the end everyone was fine. Um, but did we lose equipment in, in dealing with that fire? And, and um, yeah, so I'll leave it at those for now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, and through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. It, it was a difficult day. Um, this, uh, what caught on fire is actually a fuel. It's uh, when they chip up the uh, rubber tires, it's meant to be a fuel. And so if it's not very carefully monitored and it can ignite on its own, it's, it tends to be mixed with a, a number of other substances such that it burns more more cleanly it doesn't i'm not going to tell you it burns cleanly uh, but more cleanly uh, it burns at a very very high temperature it, it's uh and so it is quite efficient once it's fully burning but if it gets away and, and moves out of the initial where it's meant to burn into the and it burns back into the hopper it becomes quite a difficult fire to um, First of all, access, because it's actually quite high in this industrial uh, area. And then second of all, given the temperatures of the day, it was already hot. Uh, and now, the firefighters, I mean, a fire inside a home can be 500 degrees. So, um, you know, a, a hot day of 80 or 90 degrees um, doesn't help, but it, it's not the uh, factor that's going to stop us from doing our role. Uh, and our equipment was, um, was is, well, I can tell you our equipment is second to no fire department in this lower mainland and, uh, and it, it performed as you would have expected it to perform. Great, I appreciate that, thanks so much. You're most welcome. Anything else on the uh, June report? Motion to receive for information, move seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. And now on to the July report. Is there anything to add there? I have nothing to add, Mr. Chair. Do I have questions? Michael? Oh, yes, thank you uh, very briefly. Um, my question was again an, a, about a, a major event. This one's on page uh, CS57, the last one. Uh, July 26th, there was the commercial fire, fire on uh, Mitchell Road. Um, so my question, um, Mitchell Island uh, with Mitchell Road, a uh, very small uh, phrase river on either side or all sides of it. Um, when when uh, this type of um, uh, fire is, is being put out, so it's another one fire in a hopper with who knows what, what was being mi in that mix. Um, when we extinguish it and there's all that excess water uh, on a surface that is probably not very porous, so it runs right off into the river, or, or, or is there also um, containment of the what's being doused the, the, and, and the chemical nature of it? So do, is, there an, is there that layer of it when we're dealing with something on Mitchell Island with the river at the edge? Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Wolf. Uh, we uh, actually, in these types of fires, we tried very hard not to use a lot of water. Uh, we use the minimum uh, that we can, and we actually have a product called, uh, on all our vehicles, called Cold Fire. And what it does is it actually brings the temperature of the fire down uh, such that we don't have to apply as much uh, fluid to it. Um, secondarily, if we're, uh, for example, some of the sites are industrial car um, parts kind of areas, and they tend to have a lot of oils and other types of um, hazardous fluids. In those cases, we do try and uh, dam up the, uh, the, the areas where it would run into the river and have those uh, pumped away and taken away. Now, we're not always successful at that, but that's, that's our process. If I may then just a follow-up to the chair, to the fire chief on that one. Um, so do we have the, the equipment on every fire truck? Uh, yeah, so 
Is that, do we do we have enough of it? Is it is it available when when we could use it? And I, I assume if there's always one person, if it is available, trained to deploy it. Uh, if that's a priority for that staff to, to do, uh, I'm sure there's other priorities you have to check off first. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, yes, we have equipment on all vehicles. It, it actually, uh, and like most things that are effective, they're quite simple. So it can be as simple as placing plastic, removing the drain cover, placing plastic on it, put the cover back. And then of course we have pooling right on site and we don't have that pumped away. The, you know, there are, we do have very technical ways of damming and diking as well, but uh, typically when we're on a fire scene, we wanna get this done quickly, efficiently and get it out of our way. So we, we use these more simple tactics. Great, that's much appreciated. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Linda? Oh, she's muted. Linda McHale's on the line. Okay. Can Thank you, you. Can you start again? I'm sorry. We, you were uh, muted. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to the Chief. On our CS-56, the July 8th wildland fire, um, I know everybody is concerned, well, with any fire, but especially when it's uh, on Bogland. And just wondering if we know the reason, uh, what, you know, what started the fire. I think a lot of, there was a lot of chatter on social media that day about the fire. I think we could see it. And, you know, was it the train? Was it from other, like, do we know any more information? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, it's, it's still a bit speculative, but we do believe uh, it was from the train or something that emanated around the, around the operation of the train. Um, uh, but we had many small wildland fires again this year through uh, more regularly through the people uh, getting rid of smoking materials and not in a particularly good fashion. And so that continues to be an issue here in, in Richmond. Uh, and next month, I will have the, those statistics for you. Uh, but again, we've become even more successful each year in, in mitigating those fires. Not well, thanks for that. Fire. Thank you for that. And congratulations on your campaign about uh, giving out the signs. Uh, I know a couple of businesses who took you up on, you know, this was a fire that could have been prevented. And I think it was really successful. And I think a lot of people really... You know, it made you stop and think, oh, yes, yes, we can stop these things. Thanks very much. You're most okay. welcome. Thank you. Are there any other comments with regard to July's report? Motion to receive, move, second, all those in favor. Kerry, thank you, uh, Chief and uh, Jim. Okay, Thanks, anything sir. in the briefing? Uh, no, here, we have nothing for briefing. Nothing on the briefing, thank you very much. Okay, the RCMP monthly activity report, uh, page 64, we have the June report. And uh, I'm sure, okay, Will's here. So anything to add or highlight? Yes, uh, first off, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for honoring our fallen officers, uh, Constable Jim Ying and Tom Mahager. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. September is a sober month. Uh, in our detachment uh, to remember our fallen. So thank you for recognizing them. I also wanted to extend a warm welcome to Brennan as well. I look forward to working with you. Uh, with respect to our report for uh, June, and I guess also July is that, um, uh, with respect to our arsons, uh, we have um, been able to make an arrest uh, with respect to the arsons. Uh, we had had a series of uh, brush fires throughout the city. And uh, thank uh, fully to our serious crime unit. We've been able to identify uh, two suspects. They've both been arrested and charged, and we're just waiting uh, for Crown Council to approve uh, a number of charges. So just that's just an update for uh, for the arsons. Good work. Good work. And that's it. Okay, uh, Carol. Thank you very much. Um, uh, great report as always. Uh, just wanted to um, ask a question about the mental health. So uh, according to the report, uh, the mental health calls. The wait time was still 90 minutes for RCMP officers and you know that are left waiting at the hospital for someone to care for the patient and in next month's report it's 106 minutes waiting. I, 
I, that, it, it just doesn't seem right to me. I, I think that we need to do something about that. I'm ready to move a motion that we write a letter to the minister. Do you have any comments about that? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor Day. Through the chair, we have noticed that there has been a, um, um, a improvement on wait times. And uh, with respect to our, our June statistics, um, our average wait time now is down to 90 minutes. And so month over month, we've, we've realized some improvement. Uh, we are working with our, our um, partners at Vancouver Coastal Health. I know that there are renovations planned in the near future to provide uh, rooms that can secure uh, our clients and perhaps that might alleviate some of the wait times. Um, but by all means, if, um, if uh, you know um, you would like to write a letter, by all means, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you let the minister know about these wait times that they're still in? Because we keep hearing all this on the press about how we're hiring all these new paramedics, and but I mean, if they're if everyone is sitting and waiting at the hospital, you know, if they should be out doing what they do best, which is serving the public. Like, do you let the minister know about these statistics, or is it something that we should write a letter? Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Day. We do uh, have uh, regular meetings with Vancouver Coastal Health to talk about these wait times. And uh, I know that Richmond Hospital is doing everything they can uh, to accommodate us. Uh, it is a work in progress. And, um, you know, again, we, we had those discussions about a secure room, uh, ways that we can kind of uh, streamline our clients. And, of course, our Fox 80 initiative has been um, successful at uh, improving some of those wait times as well because now our officers have that information that they need for intake uh, very quickly and uh, we're utilizing a technology as well to, to uh, do the entry of the information uh, prior to arriving at the hospital so those are some of the technologies we're looking into as well to alleviate some of the wait times um, uh, but we are um, we do have some of the best wait times in lower mainline not to say that that provides any uh, comfort but we are working on improving it for sure Okay, and one other question on CS65. Uh, you mentioned that you partnered with the Transit Police and were able to arrest 17 suspects that had been doing B&Es, I believe, mostly in Richmond. Um, how often do you partner with the Transit Police? Uh, we partner with the Transit Police quite often, and we periodically will have um, uh, joint forces operations along the SkyTrain route, and sometimes we'll go to, it'll take us out to MacArthur Glen, and a lot of the... Um, our clients come from uh, downtown east side and they'll come in they'll uh you know go to the uh, outlet mall and uh you know pick up whatever they want and walk back to uh templeton station sometimes it's along uh three road where they'll walk off and uh, attack the retail outlets and of course um you know take a, a lot number of items and then get back on the train and so we've been able to uh, stop them and um so our all our joint forces operations have been very successful and, and the, there are high numbers whenever we're out there uh, working uh, in collaboration with transit. And uh, we have a very strong partnership. And sometimes uh, we will uh, uh, strategically um, uh, park ourselves near the SkyTrain stations for that reason to, uh, to discourage uh, some of their clients from coming off the train to, to, for that sole purpose of, uh, of theft of retail. So that's what we're doing right now. Okay, great work on that. Uh, so to the chair, I, I, I just, <laughs> it's, it's crazy that 90 minutes and 106 minutes for next in, in July is an improvement over what we had before. Yes. And I wonder if it just wouldn't be worth writing to the minister and mentioning that, you know, we're still, you know, our, our first responders, our police officers are waiting for far longer than they should be and ask for assistance. Okay, I, I, I probably, if you're moving, I suggest we, uh, we, we sent through the mayor's office a, a letter to the minister expressing our concern and making it a concern that this is the kind of thing that needs improvement and working on from their point of view. It, even okay, from a distance. you're moving of, that? I'll move it, yeah. Seconded, yeah. Andy, Andy, thank you. Any any further discussion? Staff under the, understand what we're, we're doing in this case? All those in favor? Contrary, carried. Okay, documented. Finished, Carol? Is that it for you? No. Thank you. Okay, Andy? Uh, thank you through the chair. Uh, thank you, Chief Superintendent. Uh, lots of information again. Um, <clears throat> just a couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, in light of the acknowledgement we've made about uh, Constable Ng and Constable Agar, um, 
I did note on page 87, uh, there were a couple minor injuries to your police officers making an arrest. And um, the question is, I'm sure they're doing fine. That would be the question. But the comment is uh, just to acknowledge that uh, police do suffer injuries. And uh, one of the unique things about them is sometimes they're accidental or whatever, but often they are actually intentionally caused by other human beings uh, with the intent to injure the officer. So uh, the question on that is just that the officers are doing fine. I take it from the... Uh, yes, Councillor Hobbs, uh, through the chair, they are they are uh, doing fine. Okay. No permanent injuries. Okay, and just a quick question regarding uh, the mental health uh, aspect to uh, calls that your members respond to. Uh, has, I might have missed it, and sorry if I did, but have you, has there ever been a study in Richmond about the correlation between all calls that police respond to, whether it's a property crime, a domestic dispute, what have you, and the um, the element of mental health or mental wellness or the lack of mental wellness in that call. Because sometimes, even when that's not the, um, the primary issue that you're dealing with, it becomes apparent that it is a factor in the call to some degree or another. And I just wondered if, uh, if there was any data on that that, uh, that you have. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor. Uh, so with respect to that question is, uh, no, there hasn't been a specific uh, tracking of um, mental health as it relates to different crime types in Richmond. However, um, I am familiar with the metrics, and it is something that uh, we've had discussions about. Um, and so we're looking at ways that we can kind of um, uh, collect or track those metrics and, uh, and, and use it in a way that's uh, of value um, for how we move forward uh, with uh, crime fighting in the future. So definitely something that we're considering for sure. And I know that Vancouver does it as well, so yeah. Thank you, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I think people would be surprised um, what a prevalent factor it is in a variety of situations. Right. Absolutely. Anything else on uh, July? Or I should say June? Okay, motion to receive, move, second, all those in favor, contrary, carried. And July, have we basically covered it? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, there's uh, nothing to add, but happy to answer questions. Questions were sort of overlapping here, but I don't want to rush through it if there are concerns. All right, motion to receive, move, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carry. Many thanks, and uh, same with fire rescue and, uh, and bylaws and, uh, and uh, RCMP, our, our, our heartfelt thanks for continuing to keep our... Uh, community safe and I'd like uh, those kinds of comments um, uh, taken back to the rank and file to know that they are appreciated and uh, the committee here on behalf of the citizens has tremendous concern uh, for its personnel and the community safety so if each of you would do that uh, from the chair uh, I would appreciate that and I know we all the committee members are all nodding their heads they are the same so a huge thank you okay Mr. Chair. Um, our strategic plan. Next item on page 103 for committee. Anything to highlight in it? Oh, an absolute fantastic um, document. We, um, just to staff, do, do all committee members have the booklet? You, the book itself as well as what's in the, in the package? Tremendous. Okay. All right. Back to you, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is that um, it was important for us to uh, not just uh, uh, stay focused on our people, promoting public safety and of course target enforcement, and that it was a, a plan that was easy to understand for uh, the committee, but it's also important for uh, it to be a plan that was easily understood by our officers as well and our, our employees. So I think we've accomplished that. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, it's, uh, it hits the mark uh, with respect to uh, with uh, council and committee. Now, uh, just a quick question to you and then to uh, senior staff. Is this going to be able to go on? Is this on the RCMP website? And can it be uh, dovetailed into the city website? I think there's a public document and I think it's something our, our citizens um, uh, should, should uh, know uh, when we've added uh, at least this past year, we've added uh, new officers in the RCMP. We've added new fire rescue. 
um, that we need to communicate, um, you know, if you wish, where their taxpayers' dollars went and where our tax increase went, and this ju justifies um, where we go uh, because our community is much safer for it. So, Cecilia, is... Through, um, through the chair, we can, yeah, we can work with communications and have it uh, on the city's website. It's normally available through committee um, minutes, but we'll make sure that it's much easier to find than that. Yeah, I think it's extremely critical that uh, we let the community know that uh, we, we do have a, a strategic plan in the community, and it's a five-year plan. So thank you very much uh, for that, Will. Uh, Carol, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor McNulty. Um, so I, I, along that exact same line, on page CS116, 116, is the uh, public safety statistics, and they're from 2016 to 2020, and they show a really, a really great downward trend in most uh, crimes. And so I wonder if we couldn't add these graphs to the next mail-out that the city does, like whether it's property taxes or whatever, um, business licenses, I think it's really important that people see these three charts because they really are a great indication because on, on, yet a, on another page it shows how our population has gone way up, 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 and yet it, for most cases the crime has either gone down or, or stabilized. So I think these charts would give um, the average citizen a real uh, sense of calmness and, uh, and make them feel happier about living in Richmond. I'd agree with you, but don't let your guard down. Yeah, and be, no, and uh, sure. you know, the, the bandits are still driving around the city and elsewhere. So let's uh, let's yeah. keep pushing them. Yeah, I would agree with you. Uh, I saw Councillor Al. Sorry. Yes, Chuck. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, report. I think this is a very nice document, uh, very informative, and I have to congratulate the RCMPs for having uh, done a good job uh, always. Uh, I just want to comment on the CS-132. Um, I'm very happy that, that uh, the RCMP has conducted uh, um, consultations and other forms of uh, information collection. And the, these key themes from the com community and from the employees and volunteers are very important. And I think especially I would like to highlight two themes, which is uh, the importance of communication because we were a very diversified uh, community. And also the importance of presence. I think that's, again, you know, I know that this RCMP is doing a good job here. And always behind the scene, it's not being visible. And they are very important. However, I think for the public, the presence of the RCMP would be very important. So I just want to, to mention that those are very important themes that come out from the uh, consultation. Good feedback. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else on the report? All right, well, thank you very much again. Uh, a document well done and I'm very proud to have it here. So we receive it for information. Move seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carry. Any items for briefing? Uh, Mr. Chair, just one item. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to committee and council for investment into community safety. Uh, I'm happy to announce that, of course, on uh, Thursday, September the 29th, uh, we will be having a grand opening of our city center uh, district police office and uh, 2.30 p.m. I look forward to uh, seeing all of you there uh, to celebrate uh, that opening. And that is the announcement. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm glad to be able to see that. Okay. Uh, any managers? No? No. Nothing further to add. Uh, Andy, River Road? I'm sorry, Linda? Okay, I was going to, okay, Linda, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did have a question of uh, Chief Superintendent Inc. I was, uh, I believe that some RCMP members were asked to go up and fight the wildfires, and I was just wondering if you could report on that. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor McPhail. Uh, through the Chair, is that over 60 officers uh, spent their summer uh, up uh, with respect to supporting the wildfire efforts? Uh, in various cities across the uh, British Columbia and northern BC and also the interior. Um, happy to report that uh, they all returned safely. Uh, they were all uh, one-week deployments uh, to protect the homes from being looted, uh, from evacuating homes, um, and uh, very proud of uh, all they've accomplished uh, to uh, keep our community safe across British Columbia. And you, I think um, 
the important piece that I, I like is that they come back with a lot of experience uh, from other communities and they see how they're policed. And uh, I think that just uh, helps them to grow as uh, as individuals and also as police officers. So so that's the great takeaway. And uh, happy to report that they've all found uh, those experiences en enriching. So. Well, thanks for the update. And I'm sure uh, all of committee uh, wishes to thank them for their service and representing Richmond so well. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Linda. Good. Okay, um, anything else? Okay, uh, Andy's got one item to deal with. Okay, Andy, I'll turn it over to you. Bring the item up. Okay, uh, thank you, and through the chair. Uh, this item regards River Road, uh, specifically uh, the area from the 17,000 uh, to the 19,000 block. Uh, includes the riverside as well as the land side, but primarily the riverside. And uh, I've spoken to a number of people that live out in that area, and they are concerned about uh, some criminal activity in the area, particularly uh, regarding stolen property and property offenses. So um, also, if applicable, uh, unsightly premises, uh, environmental concerns with uh, partially sunken boats and that type of thing. I recognize that there are multiple jurisdictions involved and there's water lots involved and different properties where the city uh, may not have uh, jurisdiction. So it, it may require a co cooperative integrated approach involving other uh, stakeholders like the province and even the federal government or the port uh, to solve some of these issues. So um, if you like, I had a um, referral that I'd like to propose. Go ahead. Okay. So the referral would be along the lines of that staff assess properties on River Road, specifically between the 17,000 block east to the 19,000 block of River Road, including the Riverside. The assessment is to include the ownership, water lot jurisdiction, for example, port, province, federal, and other relevant factors regarding compliance with the city bylaws for example, unsightly premises, environmental regulations, provincial and or federal that apply, as well as the criminal code. Further, that police bylaws and staff assess any criminal activities in particular, such as stolen property, as well as violations of, a tip of applicable bylaws and statutes as they apply and that staff report back with actionable options for committee consideration by, and I put December 7th in here, but if somebody wants to make it longer, I'm open to that. Thank you. I leave it open. Leave it open too. Okay, sure. I'll second that. Okay, Wait. any comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Contrary carried, it's a referral motion, thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything good? For, uh, anything good? Everybody has said good. Uh, does have any uh, anything for the good of uh, community safety before I adjourn and we move in camera? We need an in-camera meeting. And uh, that, like uh, the RCMP and fire rescue and bylaws to stay uh, because it does involve them. Okay, anything else? I see nothing, uh, none. So a motion to adjourn, move seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carry. Just a few moments to uh, shut things down. Um, transportation committee meeting to order. Uh, the first item, uh, any, um, I mean, uh, adoption of the minutes. So can I have a mover? Second, I've got a question. Those in favor, opposed, motion carry. The next meeting will be on October the 19th, uh, 2021, four o'clock. And uh, agenda addition and deletion. Um, we will take off item number four uh, about the active transportation infrastructure grant because we know that we've been rejected. And I know that uh, Councillor Wu, you have a request for adding two items. So are you still, do you still want to add those two items onto the agenda? Uh, yes, yes, please. I didn't hear any response from the email. Uh, so, but yes, the, sure. the two are still very relevant. Okay, so I'll me to, you want me to shorten them now? Tell you the title of them or later? Okay, so I'll put the, those under uh, 7A, seven, uh, seven which is uh, according to your email, bike car road sharing signage um, consistency. 
and 7D will be auto beachway multi-use uh, path project. Okay, those are two. Great, yep, thank you. Good, very good. So uh, we also have a delegation today um, from GTC Global Container Terminus. So can I have uh, Mr. Marco Devonco at the COVID? Yes, hello there. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for coming to make the presentation. And I just want to remind you that uh, you have five minutes and we also have your copy of the presentation. I mean, the, the, the um, PPT. So we have the most of the information. So perhaps you can use this time just to highlight uh, some of the things that you want to notice. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So uh, I wasn't aware it was only five minutes, but I will only uh, highlight the key parts and then I want to open it to, uh, to questions and feedback. And uh, thank you for letting me know that everybody has a copy of the presentation. So first of all, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to present uh, here today. I want to thank uh, City of Richmond staff and in particular Chad Pollen for ongoing engagement as we are advancing our project through the regulatory process. I also want to recognize that we're virtually gathering in traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, and, and in particular, uh, I want to recognize the GCT Delta Port Expansion Project, which we are discussing today, is located in the traditional territory of the Tawasin First Nation. Um, my goal is just to introduce GCT today, provide a bit of an overview of the project, uh, uh, why are we doing it, where we're in the process, and of course, get your, uh, get your uh, feedback. Uh, if you're okay, I'm going to quickly share the screen, if that's okay, and then just quickly flip to the slides that you already have, but I'm not going to go through all of them, just uh, the key ones. So obviously, Global Container Terminals, uh, it's a Vancouver-headquartered company, and we only operate container terminals, and we operate in two ports in North America, um, uh, two terminals in Port of Vancouver, uh, GCT Van Term and Burrard Inlet, GCT Delta Port uh, uh, at Roberts Bank. And we have two terminals in Port of New York, New Jersey, uh, one in Staten Island, and Bay on New Jersey. We are uh, owned majority by Canadian institutional investors. We're owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, uh, British Columbia Investment Management Corporation, and IFM, which is an Australian pension fund. And in the deck, you will see a um, uh, number of our uh, engagements and community partnerships, uh, including the Indigenous communities and an overview of our environmental stewardship. But really what I want to talk about today is the project we're advancing in Delta Port. This is a shot of the existing GCT Delta Port facility at Roberts Bank. Uh, it is uh, currently Canada's uh, largest uh, container terminal uh, with capacity of about 2.4 million TUs and TUs uh, uh, a 20 foot equivalent unit for the containers. And the containers you see on the ship are 40 feet. So there are two TUs in each one of those containers. We have three berths currently and 12 cranes are supported with rail access to two uh, major rail. CCT has a history of investments uh, at the Port of Vancouver. We first started operating at Roberts Bank in 1997, an expansion of the adjoining uh, pod in 2001. We have subsequently invested into that facility. We worked jointly with the Port Authority to expand that terminal by adding a third berth and was a $180 million investment. In 2018, we had a $300 million investment to further densify the terminal and semi-automated. And then uh, we also invested in our van term facility for our inlet. And of course, today here, we're talking about a billion plus investment we're advancing at Delta. Uh, this chart shows historically what's been going on with container uh, volumes in Vancouver and the projections that the Port Authority had. In general, to summarize it, container volumes have grown, but as you can see during economic downturns, the volumes kind of dip below the low case projections and then after a couple of years we turn back on that steady kind of trajectory on the medium or base case level. There is currently a lot of capacity in the existing terminals and with the existing investments that are being made that take us well into 2030. So what our project is that we're advancing at, uh, at Delta Port is be, it'd be online sometime 2030. And this chart shows that between Prince Rupert and Vancouver the existing terminal operators ourselves in Dubai Ports World, that by 2025, there'll be over 7 million TUs of capacity. Now, the volumes in 2020 were only at 4.6 million. So as you can see, lots of opportunity to grow. There's no pressure uh, to, to, to build a new capacity or to do it wrong or to rush it or to create unnecessary environmental impact. 
this is just the rendering of the project um, that we're proposing to build. So everything outside of yellow is the existing footprint of the project. Everything in yellow you see are the project components we're looking to build, which will be addition of a fourth berth, incorporation of a shortly shipping berth, as we have received feedback from the community. That's something that uh, we want to further facilitate. We've incorporated a Tuatin First Nations marina into the project based on the input from the Tuatin First Nation. And we would be expanding the railway yard that we invested in 2018, $300 million already into it. This is just another view of the different project components and where the project is and what it would take. This is just a sample of the studies already undertaken to stress that, uh, our thinking that uh, this can be further developed. And then this slide outlines why we're doing This is the most important part, why this project and why are we doing it. It is incremental approach to growing capacity. Obviously, lots of unknowns uh, on what's going to happen with economies, trade, and demand. We believe it is the environmentally responsible way to grow in incrementally based on the studies we currently have. And if we want to remain as a competitive gateway, we're providing that capacity at a very competitive per TU cost. Some of the other projects that are proposed at Roberts Bank are at $3.5 billion, which would be over $1,000 per TU of that capacity, while well, our project is more in line of $650 to $800 per T of capacity, which will allow us to remain competitive and continue capturing the discretionary cargo from the LA Long Beach and other US ports, which has really been the only source of growth in Port of Vancouver. The Canadian demand has remained relatively flat over the last 10 years, but it's the capturing of discretionary cargo uh, that's uh, been the success of our gateway. Um, the project is estimated to be online sometime in early 2030s, and I know I'm uh, running out of time, so I want to specifically uh, open for feedback from City of Richmond. As I mentioned, we have already received some feedback desired by City of Richmond to have a cumulative effects assessment performed. Of course, that is being scoped in uh, uh, as we speak, as we're discussing with the regulators. Inclusion of City of Richmond in particular in the local and regional assessment scope, and we have noted that. Um, Road and rail traffic impacts. I'm sharing on this slide a picture of projects that the Greater Vancouver Gateway Council and the Gateway Transportation Collaboration Forum have identified as potential projects. We are not direct uh, members of that forum, uh, but uh, terminals like ours are actually assessed the fee by the Port Authority to support investment in these projects. So we're looking for alignment with City of Richmond if there's something that we can advocate. Uh, to the GTCF group. Uh, we want to hear that from City of Richmond because ultimately we are, we're stuck with the bill uh, that, uh, that has to uh, support and finance some of those projects. So we want to know that we're finding the right projects and, and supporting it. Uh, and of course, there's been some feedback and questions that are out to tanker traffic from the project. I just want to affirm that we only operate container terminals. Uh, we do not handle uh, any tank traffic liquid. Uh, bulk uh, at any of our terminals where our company specifically focused uh, on gaming. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm sure your staff will already briefed you on the process, but it is a complex process that we're in. Uh, the red arrow indicates where we are currently in the process. It is a coordinated federal and provincial uh, impact assessment. Uh, we're in this stage of the process here, where there'll be some additional public comment periods uh, in uh, probably November of this year when uh, the regulators issue the joint guideline, which will set out the scope. And of course, uh, uh, we want to uh, hear feedback from the uh, city of Richmond. Uh, uh, details of, on the project are available at both websites. And uh, that really concludes uh, the five minute update. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I just want to ask members of the committee, are there any questions? I see two hands. Um, Carol? Thank you very much, Councillor Al. Thank you for the report. Uh, is this a public report that can be shared? Uh, the presentation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in what way? I mean, it can be shared, yes. I've publicly presented it, so it can be shared, but we just like to know where, on, on what venue is going to be shared on. Okay, if you could maybe send us the link then to that. I, I asked because on one of the, the maps, the project map of approved and not approved, it said not for distribution, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, we would probably, you know, if you're going to circulate it widely, like we can, we can, we can blank out that slide because, you know, projects are still in, in, in consideration stage, so we can definitely blank that out, but the rest of the, 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 the presentation is, is shared. So thank you.
Thank you. Another question. Um, this is a significant in, increase in size and um, port capabilities um, if this project goes through. Um, our biggest problem at the Massey Tunnel is trucks. Lots and lots and lots of trucks. So is there a way that you can consider opening the port 24-7 so those trucks can get through Richmond to wherever they're going uh, at 24 hours a day? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. So <clears throat> as you may know, uh, all the trucks that access port are currently GPS and there is detailed traffic analysis uh, that is available how many port-related trucks move through the existing George Massey Crossing. We can definitely share that data with you. Secondly, as part of our project assessment, we will be undergoing a detailed uh, analysis of how many new potential truck trips will be affected by the incremental increase in our project specifically, and that will be part of the, uh, the assessment uh, process as we enter it. Um, regarding your question on 24-hour operations, our actually terminals are already 24-hour operations. So our terminals are open 24 hours. We do run night gates when the demand presents itself. Uh, we have uh, a, a industry leading, actually we're leaders in North America to implement the reservation system which facilitates actually uh, staging of the trucks so the, that limits the congestion of terminals that used to occur before. And uh, our terminals indeed run night gates uh, as they're called uh, to facilitate 24-hour um, uh, operations. So you're saying it's open 24 hours now? Uh, our terminals are open 24 hours. The trucks are not necessarily but the truck gates don't necessarily operate every night, tw uh, 24 hours, when there is uh, demand. Uh, because you got to remember, 70% plus of everything that comes through terminals is rail movement. So a lot of containers just get loaded on trains and leave the terminal that way. When there is demand for the trucks, uh, we will open up a night gate uh, for, for that volume to move overnight. So it's ad hoc. Provide more so it's an ad hoc opening. It's not on the books as being open 24 hours is when you feel it's Actually, it is, it, the agreement we have uh, with Port Authority and our stakeholders, supply chain partners, we're open 90%. So 90% of the night, we are open. All right, thank you for clearing that up for me. No problem. Okay, uh, Councilor Liu. On mute. I think you're on mute. Councilor, we cannot hear you. Perhaps I can go before before uh, Councilor Liu and, and maybe she'll have a troubleshoot it. I've had issues with my AirPods before as well with the mic. So, well, shall I go? Yes, yes. Let's go to um, uh, Councilor Wu first, okay? Uh, great, thanks. Um, so just a, just a, a, a one follow-up to um, what Councilor Day asked and then just a couple more uh, short ones. Um, so I, it's really a, a, a fascinating uh, to hear about this 24-hour opening uh, being 90% of the time. Uh, I've heard many complaints or, or suggestions, solutions to the issues around traffic and and uh, all the other things with it. Um, so is it, is it the, I'm not sure if you could speak to it on behalf of the, the truck team, um, is it that the truckers don't use the 90% of those nights that are open and they only are, are called upon when, when there's demand? Um, so like, who, who, who else needs to be aware so that we spread the, the usage of it to the night as well? Because right now it's really the, the morning and the afternoon rush that get hit by the truckers who are trying to work that 9 to 5 window. Um, so who, who do you see as, as maybe needing to be encouraged to, to help, help alleviate many problems related to this? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. So one takeaway I think that would be useful for you and, and other councillors clearly is we can provide some statistics around the truck movements right now, uh, when they're moving at what times uh, at our terminals. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the, we, we run night gates, the trucks uh, book reservations that are available. There are reservations available throughout the day, the afternoon and the night. 
but of course, it all depends where they're moving or picking up those goods from. So if there are perhaps off-dock facilities like warehouses that are only open certain hours, that may limit what reservations they book or their yards where they're picking up, they may limit uh, the times. But I would say in general, you know, what I've heard, yes, 5, 10, 15 years ago, there was, you know, all the transactions were jammed into the day shift. But uh, since uh, actually 2014, when the first uh, night gets started being implemented, and then subsequently the full reservation system was implemented a couple of years after, um, uh, the traffic flows have really smoothed out based on our experience uh, through the port facility. Great. Then, uh, yeah, if, if, I'm, if we may receive the statistics you're referring to, I think that might help, uh, help, help us to locate the other end uh, of the trucking shipment that maybe they can open up to the different hours and that. So I appreciate that. Um, to the chair, just a, a couple of short ones more. Um, in your presentation, slide deck there, it, it, it meant, and you mentioned Prince Rupert um, as a location for port operations, and there was a map and there was a list, and it had names for ports and it had Delta port, but it didn't have a Prince Rupert port. So which is the name that corresponds with Prince Rupert port? And um, in your graphs, it showed uh, increase in shipping. Um, some of the graphs I've seen recently show that Delta Port is pretty much leveling off, and it's the Prince Rupert that's taking the largest share of the increase. Could you speak to those points? Yeah, so I'm not sure which slide you're referring to, but I can pull it up if you know which slide it is. Um, it's Fairview Terminal. So the, the Prince Rupert facility is called Fairview Terminal. It's operated by Dubai Ports World. So that is the container terminal in, in, in Prince Rupert. Uh, it is our competitor. Uh, and yes, uh, there has been growth both uh, in Port of Vancouver and Prince Rupert. Uh, Prince Rupert has increasing, uh, you know, proportionally probably captured a larger share of that discretionary gateway cargo. Uh, so yes, there's been growth uh, in Prince Rupert but there's also been growth uh, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, we offer different offerings, right? Prince Rupert is uh, truly only a gateway port. It has no local market uh, and uh, also is beholden to only one uh, railway access, only CN rail runs up there. Well, Port of Vancouver obviously has a number of class one railways access and variety of terminals. So it's a different offering, plus it has a significant local market uh, that it services. Great. I appreciate your expertise on that. Thanks for sharing. And uh, my last question, if I may, through the chair, um, not in your uh, report or slide deck, but uh, in other communication on, on your specific project um, you shared with us, um, could you speak to, um, um, this might be too technical, I don't know, um, dendritic channel network mitigation? There's been a lot of uh, concern around um, the dredging that would have to go on with this thermal expansion. And, mm -hmm. and some of the impacts of some of the critical salmon habitat, um, often referred to as dendritic channel network mitigation, and the concern mm -hmm. that that, um, that mitigation work is going to be detrimental to the habitat of the species. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, you. thank you for that question. So um, we are obviously entering the environmental assessment process where the impacts to dendritic channels uh, on the east side of the causeway are going to be examined. Uh, we have had in the slide where I list some of the preliminary studies, some of those studies have examined that. And uh, like any other developments, you know, I believe based on early preliminary studies we've done that that impact can be mitigated. Um, to the impact uh, of, the, uh, of the salmon uh, specifically, um, uh, the studies actually that the Port Authority has conducted for their own Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project, which we believe uh, causes a lot more significant impact. Their own studies have identified actually the juvenile salmon are a lot less present where we are proposing to expand the terminal than where juvenile salmon are present where they're proposing to expand Roberts Bank Terminal 2. So we can share those studies, they actually uh, have them online. Their own studies that analyze that and ultimately concluded actually there is less presence of juvenile salmon on our side. Uh, they're refusing to, you know, collaborate with us on further exploring that, but uh, that is, amongst other things, you know, we are engaging uh, in, 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 in a judicial review to, to uh, overcome the fact that our landlord and regulator uh, is acting in a particular biased way in this situation. Um, that judicial review hearing will happen sometime in October of this year, hopefully. But uh, to your question, uh, yes, there are dendritic channels on either side. Yes, there would be some potential impact to the dendritic channel formation 
but based on all the studies we've done, that A, they can be mitigated, and you know, uh, there is less presence of juvenile salmon based on the studies currently done. We, of course, would undertake the full uh, impact assessment uh, once we proceed to that next stage of the, of the process we're in. Great, thank you. Uh, through the chair, I don't have any further questions, but just a, a final comment. I, I had hoped in this, with this project, whatever size it ended up being, that there would be also a berm and culvert to allow salmon, adult, and juvenile to cross over. I know it would make an issue with trains and trucks having to go up and over a little bit of an overpass, but to allow salmon through. This is happening on the steep skin jetty. This is happening over at Iona. Um, so if you could take that back and, and still make that happen, I, I think that would go a long way um, to, for mitigation efforts and, and uh, the stewardship of, of the space that you're working in. Thank you. Well, we still have three members having questions, uh, so I go to Harold, Linda, and Alexa in that order. So, Harold? Yeah, um, I guess for decades I was the council liaison to the Fraser River Port Authority, and prior to the Vancouver Port Authority uh, taking over, the plan of the Fraser River Port Authority was to put major emphasis on strategy shipping. Now, I see you've got a new berth in there for short shipping. Uh, their intent was to alleviate the trucking through the tunnel uh, by short shipping, shipping, considering that the Fraser River now is an empty corridor. Uh, there's, there's no fishing boats year in and year out. And my question to you, and listen, I have another one after that, but my question to you is this one. Well, why do you not uh, put more emphasis on short sea shipping and, and uh, ship the, the, the containers from the port by say by uh, uh, what's the uh, the, uh, the, the the fast sea short sea shipping that's there uh, uh, rather than sh shipping by, by truck through the tunnel or, or over a bridge or whatever mm -hmm. great question and, and uh, as you probably know short sea shipping has been studied by Metro Vancouver by the Port Authority by Transport Canada by many others as well and it's something that you know uh, it, it is consistently being looked at in advance we as a terminal operator have very specific uh, you know, uh, ability to influence that. And uh, in this case, in our project, where we have the terminal, we would incorporate a short sea shipping berth to try to bridge the gap of making short sea shipping more economically viable. As of right now, based on all the studies that Metrovan and others have done, have largely concluded that short sea shipping is st still not economically viable within certain distances. I know the Port Authority and Transport Canada have been engaging with us and others to see if uh, they can be common user terminals built up and down the river to facilitate short sea shipping. Uh, but that's still very much in the, in the study stage and we're prepared to have those conversations. Uh, but uh, as of right now, it is still more economically viable to, you know, uh, to use the trucks. More importantly, we don't make a decision how the container is picked up. Our job is to facilitate options for our customers to pick up those containers. So whether it's by train, by truck, or by jersey shipping, but our customers, our direct customers, our direct influence is only with ocean carriers. And our job is literally to pick up the container, put it on a terminal, and then put it either on a ship, barge, or a train, uh, or a truck. And uh, and uh, if if short sea shipping facilities up and down the river become available, and there is a barge service that a customer implements, we of course will gladly load that barge. And that's why we incorporated that facility into the terminal itself, because by for example, if we were forced to, to offer our customer service barge with our large ship to shore cranes, it would also make it less economically viable. By having a dedicated berth with a specialized crane for barge service, we can, again, bridge that economic gap, hopefully, and provide that service to a customer should that customer arrive. Okay, thank you. I'm happy that you've got the, uh, the, the opportunity to do it, but I would point out that the cost of the... Uh, Trucking then is borne by the city and the region because we have to build bigger and, 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 and new tunnels and bridges to accommodate the extra trucks. So there's no ship. There, there may be uh, uh, economical uh, um, help on one side by, by using trucks, but certainly the cost of that is borne by the city and, 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 and by Metro Vancouver. Uh, my second question that uh, we worked on as well at that time uh, was an inland port at Ashcroft, and it's already there, and, and uh, we had, we, Richmond actually endorsed it. In fact, we were working with Alberni to, to assist them and try to uh, do, uh, do something with Ashcroft. So have you uh, any um, um, 
potential for your own group to actually working on the Ashcroft project. And uh, I know that they said, oh, well, you can't bring a container over and then, and then, and then uh, take it to Ashcroft and then ship the stuff back. The onus would be on the shipper to make sure that whatever was going to Ashcroft in a container would not have to come back. It would, it would be aiming to going further east. But have you looked at uh, that type of, of activity to reduce the, uh, the pressure on the lower mainland? Yeah, we as a terminal operator specifically, we have engaged with Ashcroft. Uh, we do engage with uh, Ashcroft on a regular basis. Uh, we're aware of the project. Uh, uh, we again think that our incremental approach uh, by uh, uh, growing our terminal incrementally and seeing the demand and, and building it uh, just in time for the demand, uh, you know, allows the flexibility in the system that operations such as Ashcroft may in the near future become viable or more 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 viable uh, to to service the the the, the container uh, network and container movements in Lower Mainland. Um, uh, you know, we believe that if, say, Port Authority builds a massive new landmass, as they're proposing Roberts Bank Terminal 2, it will make it less likely that a facility like Ashcroft uh, would become more viable. But Ashcroft Terminal is now owned by a global uh, expert in terminal operations. I believe it's the PSA group uh, out of Singapore. So uh, very experienced operators. Uh, we engage uh, with them occasionally. and. Uh, and uh, I'm sure if uh, anybody can make uh, Ashcroft viable, they have the expertise and knowledge how to do that. Ultimately, the challenge is rail service. So if rail service uh, facilitates uh, access to that facility, I'm sure many customers will see it. But we ourselves, as a terminal operator, cannot direct where the containers go. If a facility like Ashcroft becomes uh, available, I'm sure our customers will uh, find our gateway more attractive. Yeah, thank you very much. Linda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to the delegate. Well, thank you very much for being here today and for your presentation. You know, the City of Richmond has had the opportunity, I believe it was just January or February of this year, to provide comments to the BC Environmental Assessment Office and the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada for the provincial and federal environmental assessment phases. So um, I'm sure you've seen those. Yesterday, uh, Council had a presentation from Metro Vancouver on the draft regional growth strategy, uh, Metro 2050. So just wondering if you had the opportunity to look at that, to work with them, because I think one of our recommendations earlier is that, you know, it should be, your project should be in alignment with Metro 2040. So, and I think it speaks to something similar that uh, what Councillor Steve mentioned, a lot of times uh, projects of this magnitude, the, the impact is borne by the region and by individual municipalities. Yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. We, we the regulators received those comments. We received those comments. We incorporate them into our DPD because those comments were reflective of our initial project description. And so as quickly, I know we went through the presentation, but we noted that, you know, we recognize Richmond's uh, desire to include uh, traffic impacts and other assessments into the local and regional assessment as that gets scoped in by the regulators. Uh, we are aware of the Metro Vancouver Regional uh, Growth Strategy. We believe that our project is exactly the type of growth uh, that we should be considering in this region. It is incremental. Uh, it is borne by private sector. It is financed by institutional uh, investors like our pension plan owners. And it takes into account flexibility in the system. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we don't want to overbuild capacity because it will make it uncompetitive. But we also don't want to bring capacity too late on the system because, again, the economy and our exporters uh, and importers can suffer. So we have a long, we have a 100-year history of operating in Port of Vancouver. We have a long history of del delivering growth and, 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 and making this into the gateway that it is. And we want to just continue doing that. And we think it was the right approach. Overbuilding uneven capacity to further burden taxpayers, such as it's proposed by the Port Authority, we think is the wrong approach and not in line with the regional growth strategy. Well, thanks very much. Uh, Alexa? Perhaps you can put a question in the chat or something or... Okay, maybe uh, we should move on uh, with our agenda. So I would suggest that uh, uh, Councillor Liu uh, put your questions in writing, and I think we can always communicate with uh, um, 
the presenter, and then uh, we can also co uh, communicate with them through staff. So thank you very much for the presentation. And comment in the, in the chat box. The scope, scope of the project is much smaller. Uh, the physical footprint of the project is smaller, significantly smaller than RBT2. Yes, that is correct. And you can, I, I think one of the slides in red, you can see the proposed physical imprint of uh, RBT2 versus ours. Uh, so investment, our project is currently estimated $1.6 billion. Uh, the other project, I think, is estimated $3.5 billion. So ours is $1.6 billion. Um, based on the current uh, plan, obviously, that cost may increase uh, as we go to the environmental impact assessment when we have much more detail uh, around the required mitigation. Okay, very good. So once again, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, we, would, we should move on with our agenda. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, so uh, item two on the agenda. Um, Recommendation to award contract 7181Q um, to whoever. Okay, so any any further information or highlights staff wants to make? I have nothing to add, Mr. Chair. Staff is here to answer questions. Uh, Michael? Th uh, thank you. Uh, very briefly, um, my question is about um, the, I know the long history of working with this contractor. Um, and long history of Richmond dealing with um, drainage and, and digging and such. Um, do we have any uh, existing city trucks or, or equipment um, that is also used? So if, if there is a, a downtime between contracts or after the three years is up, it mentions that the contractor would, would inform us about needing more years. Um, or are we training staff with our own equipment to be able to do some of this in minor capacity. Um, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, to my knowledge, we don't have any existing um, city um, truck that or equipment that is able to do the type of work that's in this contract. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. So we have a staff recommendation. Do I have a mover? Move and second it. Call the question. Those in favor? Oppose. Motion carry. Moving onward to number three. E-scooter pilot project. Um, do you have any further information from staff? Mr. Chair, I do not have anything further to add to the report and staff are available to answer any questions. Okay, Michael. Uh, th thank you, a couple parts to this one, but they will be brief. Um, question is, uh, this is, is great. This is the city of Richmond, and, a welcoming a, a, a pilot uh, pro project within our city, um, but is there a discussion at the at the regional level, at the Metro Vancouver level, uh, responsibility perhaps of TransLink to work on getting a coordinated effort across all Metro Vancouver municipalities? Is that or is Richmond part of that movement? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, yes, uh, City of Richmond staff do attend. Uh, regular meetings with TransLink uh, regarding coordination of micromobility initiatives across the region. Okay, thank you. I think that's the, the way of the future. If all of the municipalities have uh, community energy mission plans like ours uh, to, to alleviate um, the, the emissions, we need to help people not just within Richmond, but crossing and having destinations outside of Richmond. Um, anyhow, it's still very valuable to have the pilot to get people used to the equipment and such. Um, uh, the next question I had related to this is uh, a little bit when I was reading the report, it talked about um, Lime Technology, the company, um, doing e-scooters um, and e-bikes. But in the, in the title of this uh, project or this report item, it just says e-scooter. So is there a second one coming for e-bikes or, or does this item encompass both? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, the latter, in fact, uh, the program will include both e-scooters and e-bicycles. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just a follow-up uh, comment then to the chair. Um, I, 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 yeah, I appreciate the, the work on this. To, to, we're not um, um, probably not going to be the first community to have e-bike and e-scooter um, piloting, but uh, we're very close to being in the lead uh, for that, and I think we're so suitable having our our geography of a flat island for the most part. Um, and uh, I also um, 
one, uh, appreciate the acknowledgement of, of speed limits that have two settings. So the roadways at 20 kilometers an hour and the paved pathways um, at 15 kilometers an hour. And I hope we do um, be, uh, are, are quite critical of those speeds, um, not just for the users of the equipment, but people who are not using who could be hit um, by those who are using it. Um, so that we look at those numbers. I know other municipalities outside of Canada uh, have been lowering what they initially allowed to, to slower speeds. So I hope we, um, we we take swift action if that needs to happen. Thank you. Okay. So, um, oh, uh, MP. Thank you through the chair. Um, it was a very uh, comprehensive report and I can see why the company was selected uh, through the criteria. The uh, just things like the training mode and the 39 languages, uh, lots of information. Just from a risk management and more of a legal point of view, is there any jurisdiction that's had experience with the pilot or with the company or with other companies in terms of um, risk management issues that have been identified? In ter I can imagine that there could be, um, through the learning curve, uh, some injuries, some incidents that might result in uh, possibly um, some kind of legal action or suits. Was there anything like that in any other jurisdiction that they've experienced or has it all been relatively trouble free? Uh, through the chair, uh, there have been issues with respect to safety. The bylaw amendments uh, endorsed by council um, at the start of this pilot program have been developed to mitigate uh, safety issues with respect to speeding and limiting the areas of operation in the city of Richmond. Uh, the contract will be reviewed by city risk management staff and appropriate insurance and indemnification for the city will be secured. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Councillor Lou? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Great. I've got multi things going on here. Um, uh, thank you for the report and thank you for the hard work on this. I think lots of people are excited for more and different ways to get around town. Um, I did notice that it's 18 plus for um, people to get in, and I'm guessing that's because of the, there's legislative rules, my understanding, on whether or not people can um, get into a rental agreement. But it, it seems to me that maybe this is something that we need to write a letter to the Attorney General over, because it, it seems to me that if you're as young as 16 years old, you can get a driver's license, you can buy yourself a nice McLaren, you can license that McLaren, you can rip around town in it. You should be able to rent a scooter or rent a bicycle. And so I think, um, you know, I, I'd like to put this in as a, a, a motion uh, to, that we write a letter to the Attorney General so that when people as young as 16 can get a license and buy a car and insure that car, they should also be able to rent a bike or a scooter. And that we'd like uh, the Attorney General to review the legislation that it excludes people under 18 from being able to access uh, these different forms of transportation in our community. Okay, uh, maybe I would deal with your motion after uh, letting Councillor Day ask him the question, okay? Thank you very much, Councillor Al. Um, so it's an exciting program, and I think the, um, the company that you've chosen sounds like they really are on board, and I'm impressed by the GPS technology, the ability to slow the bikes down and scooters down. I, I think that's great. Will there be clear identification of each unit should someone be walking down a shared pathway and someone does something that is dangerous or is, um, you know, in, you know, unrespectful or, you know, just dis disregard someone, for example, with a walker, you know, or, or a stroller, will they be able to identify the bikes and call it in? Through the chair, the counselor uh, day, yes, these, um, e-scooters and e-bikes will be branded. Um, they're typically green in color, very bright and vibrant and easy to identify. I get that they'll be easy to see, but if bike number four, bike number 54 is the one that was the problem, will there be that kind of identification on these bikes and scooters? Through the chair, each device has a unique identification number on it and we will work with the proponent to ensure that so it'll be visible from, you know, 20 feet away. It'll be like a big enough number that someone can see it. 
through the chair, it will be uh, limited to the size of the device. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, through the chair to Councillor Day, maybe I can help um, answer this question. Um, I think one of the key features here is that these um, e-scooters, the, these rental e-scooters are all geolocated. So if you know where the incident happened and uh, when it happened, uh, you can, through the geolocation, uh, find out who was operating the scooter at that point in time and, and get a hold of them. Okay, that's okay. So if um, something happens, you know, a little old lady gets knocked over walking with her walker, um, and there's GPS uh, technology, that's great. Can we source that information and use it to go to the authorities, such as the police? Uh, through uh, the chair to council day, yes, yes, I yes, we can. Okay, because you know we can't do that with other types of technology that we have in the city. So is this different because it's um, a private company? Uh, through the chair to Councilor Day, I'm not aware of the other uh, things that you're talking about, but um, I believe with this one, if there was uh, an injury uh, that, that happened through this process, we can get that information of who uh, was operating the scooter at that time or the scooter company itself would likely be liable. But uh, I'm not a lawyer, and we'd have to check with uh, law to determine if that is the case. Okay, um, I, I didn't want to mention the other technology because it's in camera, so that's why I'm not mentioning it now. Uh, if we could get a memo on how the process would work in the event of an injury and how the company would be would be providing the pertinent information. It's like you said, if you know at such and such corner at such and such time, this is what happened. Uh, if, if you know, then you don't need the big number on the back because you've got the location and you know who was there at that particular location. I suppose where that might be a problem is if there was four or five e-scooters or e-bikes at the same location at the same time. But um, yeah, if we could just get a little more information on that to make sure that it is completely accountable. I think it's a great idea. I think it's going to be a big hit in the city. But I know the, uh, particularly the seniors that I've spoken to have been really concerned about what if happens if they sneak up on me and I don't hear them because they're so quiet. And so that's my only concern. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'm coming, going back to uh, Councillor Lu. Can you repeat your motion? Uh, thank you. So we wrote a letter to the Attorney General uh, asking for a review of the legislation that excludes people under 18 from uh, renting scooters and e-bikes and having access to alternate forms of act transportation within our communities. Okay. So you see that second? Is this second? Okay. So second. Okay. So any further discussion? Uh, Linda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question uh, about the, uh, the wording of that, because did not we, we had the e-bicycle program, and weren't, what was the age limit on that? Was that not 16, or was it 12? We had 16, I thought, and, but part of it was that the parents had to be able to, like, it was a workaround instead of, like actually relook at the legislation and figure that out, right? So um, I think the, gov the attorney general should, in my mind, um, at least match 16 year olds to be able, if you can buy a car, you should be able to rent a scooter. And then below that, then they figure out whatever the workaround is, whether or not someone can engage in um, uh, a okay. contract. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Andy? Thank you, through the chair. Just on that point, um, I wonder if staff can comment on, on the age, if there was a rationale for that, and if it has actually something to do with the pilot program itself. And um, Anyway, I just wondered if there was a rationale for that that you've been exposed to. Thanks. Can staff answer that? Through the chair, with respect to the shared uh, service, uh, the minimum age of 18, we staff have done research, and it is consistent across North America for the rental services. Um, it's the business decision on the part of the proponent to have that as a minimum age. Thanks. 
Well, uh, no further discussion. So I would call the question on this motion. Those in favor? Oppose? Motion carried. Now, we go back to the staff recommendation uh, and, and uh, I mean, the recommendation on the pilot project. So do I have a move of the move, move second? Any further discussion? I call the question. Those in favor? Oppose? Motion carried. Thank you very much. So moving onward to item number five, uh, sanitary sewer repairs, 8,000 block, Capstan Way. Any further information on this item from staff? Nothing further to add and available to answer questions. Okay. Any questions? This staff recommendation, do I have a mover? Second. Move and second call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carry. Item number six, Green Fleet Action Plan. Uh, anything to add to the report? Mr. Chair, I have nothing to add. Okay. Uh, questions? Um, Michael? Uh, thank you. Uh, through the Chair, just a comment and a quick question. Um, I appreciate in the staff report the staff's um, recommendation to go with the Diamond Lane Pledge, which is the, the more uh, stringent, uh, higher um, challenge perhaps to, to bring more electrical vehicles to a fleet, so I appreciate that. Um, my, my question now is about, uh, and maybe it doesn't fit in here, so please uh, just clarify that. Um, we, we don't hear a lot of, well, mayor council email, don't get a lot of complaints about um, the city trucks not being electric, but we definitely do when it comes to landscaping equipment. Um, is that at all fit into um, the Green Fleet Action Plan, or are all of our landscaping non driving uh, equipment, um, something else, and what's that called? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, the, we do purchase these uh, types of equipment that you're speaking of that are used for our parks operations. We are actively and constantly looking at what is available in the marketplace. At the moment, what we are finding with um, chainsaws and these uh, mowers and various types of equipment is that while there may be some for residential use, they're not quite there yet for commercial use and the type of application that we would need and how long the batteries would need to last. But it is part of our Green Fleet Action Plan. It is something that we will uh, be incorporating as well for future part of what we do as well. Okay. Uh, Andy? Uh, thank you. And through the chair. Um, well, being relatively new, I, I found this report fascinating and actually really encouraging. So, first of all, it is commendable uh, to be setting the goal higher. Um, one of the things that I, I also found really interesting was with heavy-duty uh, vehicles and the possibility of hydrogen fueling systems, uh, especially for the heavier-duty cars, because that's something you hear about with battery life in terms of the larger vehicles. So, um, I understand from reading the report there's a bit of a lack of infrastructure and uh, you don't hear as much about it, but um, what, can you just comment on the possibility for greater use of hydrogen-powered vehicles, particularly heavy-duty ones? And is that a realistic um, opportunity, or does the lack of infrastructure just w severely limit it? Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, currently the lack of infrastructure does limit it. However, there is considerable action at the federal and provincial level to help uh, promote the production of hydrogen um, as we uh, as this area advances. So we do see hydrogen as a potential application for the heavier duty types of equipment down the road. So we are continually monitoring that action at the federal and provincial level, which would include grant funding to help create that infrastructure. Thanks. Uh, I think that's actually pretty exciting. Um, so thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, no further, I see no further questions. Uh, so this staff recommendation, do I have a mover? Move, second, I call the question, those in favor, oppose, motion carry. Okay, item number seven, A, uh, Councilor Wolf, the floor is yours. Th thank you very much. And I, I um, had sent this out to, um, some on staff, and I, and I thought there'd be a reply, before, and then I would send it to all of the members of the committee. So I apologize, I didn't I get it out. So I'll be I'll be brief. The, the first one, um, you can call it um, signage for for 
sharing the road. Um, when cyclists um, ha are unable to use their multi-use use pathway, uh, like we had uh, item number four, which was taken off this agenda, two areas where we have multi-use pathways, um, and there's others, such as Westminster Highway um, east of number six road. Um, when there's construction going on, like there is on Westminster Highway, and there's paving uh, to, to fix the old paving that was there, um, the, the cyclists have to move off of that area and go on to the road. So I brought up when I first saw this, the, this work that's going on, um, the cyclists being a bit confused, not a lot of signage for them, and also for the drivers, there wasn't a lot of signage for them to know that they have to share the road. Um, so I'm going to get to a, a referral I, I think is what's necessary to uh, direct staff to generate new signage. So when we have contractors doing the work or city staff, we have, we have standardized signage. And uh, as some of you know who were at the UBCM convention last week, um, there was a, um, a resolution passed to ask the province to have um, a one meter safe passing distance for vehicles going around cyclists if you're going 50 kilometers or less and 1.5 meters safe passing distance if you're going over 50 kilometers an hour. Um, so I, I, I would hope that maybe we can work those numbers into our language, into our signs, but, and, and they would just be mobile signs that when we're doing this type of project work, we can place them uh, for cyclists and for um, uh, drivers to see. And when the work's not going on and, and the workers' trucks are moved uh, and vehicles uh, and cyclists can again use the, that route, then we can take the signs down. But if, it, if in some cases, like Westminster Highway, even when the trucks go for the day, you still can't utilize the full MUP, multi-use pathway. Um, so the signs would need to stay up. But maybe they could be closer to that that location where the problem is remains not a problem um, the work needs to remain um, so um, I'd, I'd like to hear anything from committee on this or maybe staff have a comment saying we already have this we just didn't install it for the West Minster Highway project then we don't need a referral um, otherwise I would like us to have um, a potential referral with language that we utilize these signs throughout the city can staff respond to that through the chair to Councillor Wolf. So for the uh, Westminster Highway project, uh, for pedestrians, there is uh, the gravel shoulder, which they can use for passage. Um, staff uh, or crews are able to assist pedestrians in moving through the, the gravel shoulder uh, through the construction zone. Uh, this option is also available to cyclists. Um, also, in addition to that, for cyclists using the roadway, uh, we do have some uh, take the road sign. Uh, this is where the cyclists can be using the full lane um, through the construction zone. Uh, unfortunately, there's inadequate space to allow for uh, share the road for cyclists and uh, and vehicles. Oh, oh, then if I may uh, do so, so we have signage that the cyclists can read that they need to take a different route, but it, it, there there's no signage for the drivers to to take any further consideration. For my mind, other than they're in a construction zone, which still means you you stick to your the middle of your lane. But if, if they need to be informed that cyclists are taking the lane or the space, I think that that message is missing. Uh, and you get a lot of quick swerves of vehicles when they didn't know that there was another a cyclist in front of the vehicle in front of them. So I'm not sure. If, yeah, that's just not being addressed from, from my experience. So, John, you want to the chair? Yeah, I'm just, uh, we can, I don't think we need a referral. We can certainly take it under advisement to have a look. It is a complex environment, and we do do substantial signage when we do any traffic control on a construction site. Um, and so there are issues we can certainly work with Lloyd's team and transportation to review what improvements we could make um, that, that would help with that and certainly look at uh, other options for night construction and things like this. We do that on a regular basis, but we can certainly take a look at it from the cyclist point of view as you're outlining. Uh, and see what improvements we, we could make in that regard. Sometimes if, if the signage is just too complex or whatever, that we always face that challenge. It doesn't have the impact that you're hoping for. Um, but we'll take that away and have a good look at it and see what we think would be beneficial in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, through the chair, I'll, I'll retract the need for the referral um, and then have staff no also note that the, the UBCM resolution around the one and the 1.5 meter 
safe passing distance, that we prepare for that if, if it indeed comes from the province. And then um, the final point from this, uh, with all the transportation staff here as well, uh, next week is bike to work week, bike to school week, bike wherever week. Um, and so many people are going to be hopping on the bike for the first time and being surprised by some of these sites. So I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, paramount that we get uh, all signage, any signage we can, uh, to alleviate any challenges that will come on, uh, on next Monday and all of next week. Thank you. Uh, Linda? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I cycle a lot, and um, a couple weeks ago I was cycling on Granville, just uh, heading east, just past number two road, and there was construction there, so the bike lane was closed. So there was construction, and so I had to go onto the road, and there's the buses. So I, I understand how it can be seen to be perhaps confusing and dangerous. I'm just wondering if this is an opportunity to take this topic to the Traffic Safety Advisory Committee to have some discussion with them, because that would include uh, the cycling community, that would include the um, accessible community as well. Can you stop coming? Uh, through the chair, did Council Member fail? Absolutely. We can certainly work with Lloyd's team and, and do that. Thank you. Okay, shall we direct staff to uh, pick up on this item and follow up with, um, I mean, appropriate it? Would, would that work for you, Councillor Wu? Okay, good. Staff, it's okay, right? Yes, and we can provide you a memo uh, down the road once we've uh, uh, figured out some actions that we can take in this regard. Okay, good. So, uh, Councilor Wolf, do you still have a second issue? Yeah, yes, I do. Seven uh, B. Um, what we could call it maybe is, is uh, multi-use or oh, sorry, Alder Bridge uh, Way multi-use pathway. We've received a number of uh, staff memos on this. Uh, there was a September 14th and a sep and August 20th. Um, sorry, the August 20th is of this year. The other one was last year. Um, so I, I thought before the the work that would be going on, which is apparently starting this week. Uh, it didn't officially start today, I checked. Um, I thought there would have been an item coming to council uh, or committee first, but it, it appears it's not. Um, so I, I have some concern over this project um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. I'll be very brief. Um, so this is a, an area on the north side of Alderbridge Way. I'm sorry I don't have a map here for you. Um, but this is north of the D and D lands. Uh, this is in between Four Road and Shell Road. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a straight with a little uh, S curve, kind of in the middle of it, of Alderbridge Way. So the north is a trail. Uh, it's a gravel trail. In and around this area, uh, the Nature Park has bark mulch trails. The Shell Road is a gravel trail. Uh, to the west is the new extension of the Alderbridge uh, multi-use pathway, which is paved. And you can see it, it's really close to the road. Um, my concern is this final extension of it is going, was originally going to take out many, uh, many more trees, I think it was 60 some odd trees. Uh, staff, I appreciate the revision to now only need to take 40 uh, trees out. Um, but the, the concern is, um, I, I don't think uh, this amount of work is necessary. Um, I, I've used this trail and, and helped to clean it up for 17, the last 17 years, uh, and and to, to see the sign uh, on a Sunday night put up saying 40 trees are going to be removed and looking to what were those trees, and some of them are, are the old Richmond old growth, shore pine, the original log pole not planted there at their base. They're in the peat soils with sphag You don't see the sphagnum moss, but it's down there. Uh, there's areas where bog plants are growing not planted, and this is close to a, a road. There's very little places left anywhere in the city. Um, there's the Greater Lulu Island Bog, Nature Park, and the East uh, Lesser Lulu Island Bog, and that's about it. You don't find the native plants, the salals, coming up naturally, and it's because the ground is not compact. What this project is to allow is to pave a, a section wide enough for a truck to go on, um, although it's not meant for trucks, um, but for maintenance, um, and, and, and yes, trees will be spared, but the areas that we're sparing are the areas that are impacted because many moons ago, we loaded fill on top of the area to the north. And except for the, the 
area to the southern strip, we never impacted it. And that's where the native plants are, and that's where we're going to put this asphalt paved road or uh, trail. And 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 I think there there's been a lot of public backlash on, on some of the tree removals that have happened recently in the city. This one uh, is taking people by surprise. Um, I, I I know people who live in the area. They weren't notified that this was um, happening. Uh, the signage that's put up on the tree removal is put in the areas where a lot of people don't see it. The other part of the trail to the north, there was no sign there. Um, so I, I just felt the need to bring this forward to uh, the chair of this committee and to the staff to, to ask for a hold on the project to see if there could be any further debate, uh, discussion um, at this committee level. So I'd appreciate if there would be a staff response or if anyone on, on committee has further uh, to say on this. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and I might have another short comment based on what's said here. Any comments from staff? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, yes. So through this project, there are a number of trees that do need to be re removed, uh, but this is to facilitate the construction of a multi-use pathway, which was approved by council. Uh, this project also does include a number of uh, safety improvements. That includes uh, street lighting, as well as a, a 1.5 meter tree buffer. Uh, that will provide a uh, buffer to, to traffic. Um, again, as you've noted, we do have a retaining wall which is uh, installed on the, on the site, which will minimize the number of tree removals. Uh, this will also, again, minimize the amount of disturbance to some of the existing uh, ground, uh, including uh, minimizing soil compaction. So my understanding oh. is that the project is ongoing, right? To the chair, the, this project was done in two phases. The first phase um, at Four Row that has been completed, uh, and the second phase is about to start. Um, the construction will be starting shortly. Michael? Uh, yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the trail, and I apologize if, if some out there who are lost with what I'm talking about. Um, but this, this trail, to speak to two points that were just raised there, um, this is a, a, an area where wildlife uh, share the space with the recreational users of the trail. When I used to work at the Lake Major Park, this was my go-to route uh, to Major Park. I talked to many people who use it on a regular basis. Um, lighting is not something um, that I think necessary in this space. Uh, there is already street lighting that shines through the trees, especially when leaves are down. And there is a way to get around the other way if you want to stay on a, on a sidewalk the whole way, you can do it and go all the way into the Audlin Wood Park and come around the other way if you want to stay off the gravel. That's fair enough. And another point is the buffering. If you look at the, this, the, the area to the west that's been completed, the buffering is like a few feet of grass with a couple of thick trees planted in it. The, this, the trail of the area I'm talking about here uh, is very well buffered. You can barely even hear some of the sounds of the vehicles going by because you have such thick growth. And I'm so concerned, again, once again, that we're, we're, um, we're doing tree removal, but it's not just the trees. It's the low vegetation. It's the, the permeability of the soil underneath the tree canopy. But when we lose it, it's gone. We're not getting these native plants sprouting up in other boulevards and other strips of grass. Uh, we're, we're losing the last of it, and we have so less than 1% or 2%, whatever uh, it is we claim. And, and this is an area where it's in our jurisdiction, where to the south of, of Alderbridge Way, the DND lands, they did their cutting uh, without, uh, without of our, out, out of our hands. But again, they didn't compact the ground. They just brought trucks in, removed stuff, and they're going to have to do it every year. Um, so that's going to cost them to do that. Um, but I think bringing in gravel, um, bringing in uh, uh, some, some, definitely some crews to do uh, a lot of staff work at maintaining the Blackberry or removing Blackberry would be great. There's not weed in there. Um, and, and, and so there's definitely some work that needs to be done. So I'm not saying um, that, that staff should go somewhere else. They need to go there and they need to do things. But it's, it's the, the loss of 40 trees and the retaining wall that are going to just take away some of the, the, some of the mess we have left. left. Um, so if I could vote on something today, I'd vote against this for now. Uh, it seems there's no item um, on the floor yet, so I'll, I'll make a referral. Uh, I don't. I didn't want, plan to want to do this, but I don't hear anything from committee. Uh, so I, I'd like to make a referral to, to put a soft work order on this project, and to uh, uh, to have um, uh, a 
thorough uh, conversation with some of our advisory committees, a further mail out so people are actually identify, aware that this is going to happen. Otherwise, there's going to be a, a, quite a backlash of all the communities in and out of Richmond seeing what we're going to do uh, to some of this natural area. So a stop work order so that we can reassess and, and get better stakeholder consultation. Um, and maybe even come back at next month's uh, public works committee meeting. So I, I would move that referral if, if this is the appropriate time. Okay. Um, this project has been approved by council and is ongoing. Uh, so the request is to have a referral to defer um, or to stop the project for now and bring 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 forth uh, any further discussion until the next meeting. Um, now. Councilor Wolf is moving this motion, um, referral motion. Do I have a seconder? So I do not see there's a seconder for the motion, so the motion uh, will not stand. Okay, so any further comments on this one? Seeing none. Uh, any manager's report? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, just a bit of clarification on item four that was removed from the agenda. Uh, the item was removed uh, from the agenda because we were just recently uh, notified by the province that city's application for the grant funding, noted in the staff report, were not successful. Um, just a bit of background on the application process. Um, all the required information for the application was submitted on time. Um, our submission was not uh, selected because the program was uh, oversubscribed. Uh, it's highly competitive with, with 122 applications and very limited amount of budget is available. Nevertheless, um, because our projects do meet the, uh, the funding requirements, we were encouraged to reapply again next year. Uh, with regards to the two projects identified uh, for, that we applied for funding, uh, they will continue to uh, they will continue as planned. Um, there are already committed funding from the city as well as TransLink. Um, TransLink is funding more than half of the project cost, uh, just under 5.8 million dollars. So, with that quick update, um, I'm available to answer questions if there are any. Any questions? Okay, no. So, any any managers will any more? Uh, Milton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanted to give a quick update on the storm event from this past weekend. Um, as everybody knows, on Friday there was quite a, a significant storm event. Uh, between 50 and 70 millimeters of rain fell in different parts of Richmond. Uh, that represents either a two-year or a five-year um, rain event, depending on which area of Richmond that you're in. Uh, the preparations from the crews uh, were quite, worked quite well. There was only 10 service requests over the entire weekend, uh, just for minor localized flooding and a couple of downed branches from the trees. Okay, very good. Okay, any questions on that? Seeing none, any further manager's report? Seeing none, we have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, meeting is adjourned, thank you very much.